I uh, I was a starving student once. I know I know how a good a good free lunch is awesome. So okay, so let me give you a quick introduction of who I am. I am I, I'm, I'm John Parker. Uh, a couple things interesting about me: I've been married for 15 years. I've got four kids, three boys, and a little girl. If she had been first, I would have one child. <laughs> I, I love my daughter to death, but she is a handful and a half, and uh, she's got red hair, so it's like just compound upon, upon the situation. I did serve an LDS uh, mission in Ibra Franco, Brazil, so I speak Portuguese. Uh, I understand most of Spanish, but that's about it. Uh, I went to college at BYU-Idaho. It was Rick's when I started, and I got my degree in computer science. So just quick, I want to know who you guys are. Who, how many of you are computer science degree majors? All right, good. How about informatics? Let's see, now I'm told there's two informatics. There's a business informatics and a health informatics. Okay, a couple of health informatics, business, mostly business. Okay, great. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about um, my path. So I came out of college. I was a web application developer. I worked for a small company in Rexburg, Idaho. Um, we thought we were pretty awesome. There was a total of 15 people in the entire company. And uh, I spent my first couple of years there. It was, it was an amazing experience. So I learned a ton as a web developer. I learned, I learned a lot of code. I learned a lot about databases. I learned a lot about all those kind of ecosystem and how that works together and, and some of those things. But one of the things I learned is that the languages that I had learned in college were dying very quickly. How many of you still write in Perl? Nobody. Right? That was our main language that I learned in college when I went for computer science. So we did Perl. Cobol. What's that? I've got one even better, Cobol. Cobol, right? <laughs> um, so one of the things that I learned early, early in my career, and, and this is what I tell people is the most valuable thing I learned. So as a computer science major or as an informatics major, the most important thing I learned is, is that it's my job to learn how to learn. And what I mean there is, the syntax you use, the, the languages that you use, the technology that you use is changing so fast that it's mostly obsolete within about five to ten years. It's kind of the turnaround that I've seen. So I spent a lot of time learning Perl, and I was, I was the Perl master, and I thought things were pretty awesome. And then I quickly learned that that language was starting to die out. It was being replaced by other languages. It was being replaced by Python, by PHP, um, object-oriented languages like C Sharp and Java. So for the CS guys, those of you that are software devs or have done some coding, what languages do you guys normally use? C Sharp, C++, okay. Java. Visual Basic, okay, got a little bit of Java going on. That's awesome, got some Groovy, nice. Okay, so one of the things that I love about software development and languages, and one of the reasons I tell people that I, that I speak Portuguese is because the intent of what you're trying to do with your software language is the same from language to language. It's just the syntax, and it's the methodology, and it's the performance, and it's all of those kinds of things. And that was something that I'm incredibly grateful for that I learned early in my career. Because not if, if I had gotten stuck in the Perl world, I'd be working probably for research somewhere and, and just doing Perl, right? If I'm never able to advance, then you kind of get stuck in that language. So. A couple other interesting things about me. I left my first job after I had moved from uh, technical support to developer to senior developer. Out of all four developers, I was the senior developer. And I realized there wasn't a lot more for me to learn and to do at that job. And so I left. I went to a company in Idaho Falls called DocuTech. And I was the director of internal tools there. So I built internal tools for the system, or for the company. I, I walked in. I originally walked in, and I was an account manager. I had decided that uh, as much as I love computers, I like talking to people as well. And so they put me on as account manager for their software. And after about three months, I said, you guys have serious process problems. So I went and built some software for the internal systems to use. And uh, to my knowledge, they still use that software today. I'm pretty good friends with the owner and some other people over there. And they use that software on a daily basis. Okay? I originally wrote it in Perl and then had to convert it to csharp.net later. Uh, because Perl's a dying language, right? So I did that for a while, and then I, I promoted. I was their vice president of research and development. Um, so we built commercial software. That's what Dr. Tech does, is we build commercial software that manages mortgage lending. So I had been there for about five years, and the CIO at Melaleuca was a good friend of mine, and he called me about every six months. Hey, man, you got to come over here. Hey, man, you got to come over here. And I'd tell him, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And finally one time I said, you know what, let's take a look. Let's see what's there. And so 
I went over and I interviewed with Mel Luke, and I didn't know hardly anything about Mel Luke, even though I grew, I, I grew up in Idaho Falls. I didn't really know a lot about them as a business. I knew that they put on the fireworks every year, and they handed out the Scotty for food bags every year. And that was kind of about the, the most I knew about them. So I went to Metaluca, did my interview, I learned a lot of really interesting things, and I became intrigued with the company. So I finally decided to take the jump, and I, and I took a jump, I went over and I got hired on. I was the lead architect for a major project we had in 2008, which was to convert their website from Cold Fusion to c -sharp So, Cold Fusion, dying language, this is starting to become like a theme in my career, right? <laughs> Take this dying language and convert it to something that's more useful. So, we went through this project and we converted the website from Cold Fusion to c -sharp And it's currently running on the c -sharp platform um, everywhere in the world. So, just a little bit about Meluca. Let me tell you a quick story. So, we are a almost a $2 billion company in revenue. We did $1.7 Seven five billion is the official number last year in revenue. Um, we our corporate office is in Idaho Falls. Anybody ever driven by the castle? Right, that's that's where we work. That's where the corporate office is. Um, and we have we do business in 16, 17, 17 countries. Nineteen. Nineteen. I can't even keep track anymore. So we do business in nineteen countries. From a from an IT guy and a data perspective, we have eight different data centers. Now, when I say data center. For anybody who's ever dealt with data centers, I mean anything from the multi-million dollar data center that we have in Idaho Falls. And if you ever want a tour of that, come down and talk to Jeff. Happy to show you guys around. So we have a multi-million dollar data center there, and we have like four servers and a closet somewhere in Europe, and we call it a data center. So it spans based on the size of market. So the biggest markets are, are China and the US, Taiwan, some of our Asia Pacific markets are the biggest. Um, and we do, we do, so we have these big data centers that we use everywhere. Um, when, I, when I came to Meluca, I did that conversion, and so now we use that website in all eight of our, all eight of our markets. We service all 19 countries using that, that c -sharp website. And when I finished, they asked me if I would help them do some internal data, because the company was kind of running a little bit crazy trying to figure out what, we have all this data, we don't know what to do with it. So, uh, I started a business intelligence group for Mel Luca, and there were two of us. There was me and my boss, and that was it. And we started the business intelligence group. So um, I had to learn a new language. It was uh, it was it was kind of the the Visual Basic C sharp um, mixture that they put into SSRS. Anybody know what SSRS is? SQL Server Reporting Services. It's a platform that Microsoft SQL Server Group puts out that allows them to do reporting off of SQL database connections. Okay. And you can use other database connections as well. So we built out an enterprise level reporting package, figured out how to deploy it to all eight markets, and we started building, building out from there. After that, we started working on data warehousing. Um, and after about two years of doing that hands-on very much, they asked me if I'd be an IT director. And I, and I kind of cringed for a second and went, but I really like playing in the code. <laughs> but yeah, I'll go be an IT director. So now I manage a couple different teams. So I have a team that's a specialized team of SQL developers, and these guys, all they do is write SQL code all day long. Um, uh, Beard, right? Dr. Beard told me that he uses, he uses our month-end example as an example in some of his classes. This is my team. They're the compensation team. They collect data from all eight of those, all eight of those data centers. They bring it together, and they calculate out how much money we're going to pay out to the individual marketing executives. Okay? Those of you that don't know a lot about Melica's business, the way it works, we manufacture and distribute um, consumer goods. Soap, shampoo, cleaners, vitamins. There's like 450 products that we manufacture and distribute. So we don't sell software, right? I came from commercial software into this company that doesn't sell software. So what we do then is we sell all these products and we build all the systems to support it. But the only way you can buy products from Melica is if you're a member of Melica. So you have to be, you have to sign up to be a member, and the only way to sign up to be a member is to be referred by a person. So when your friend refers to you, then you order from the company, we'll pay a portion of your order to your friend as a thank you and as a reward for them for marketing our, our products to that person, okay? And so we gather all that data to figure out who referred who and how much ordered who and, and all those things, and we build this giant graph and we figure out exactly how much to pay and then we cut checks. And uh, we just did it last week, we do it once a month, it takes us about four or five days to gather the data, audit the data, calculate, and then 
we recalculate two or three times, and then we cut checks. Um, we cut checks in the ballpark of over $30 million a month off of that system. And so that's what one of my teams does, we just calculate all of that and all that data. I have another team that's heavily focused on our data and our business intelligence groups. And so we've got report writers that use the SSRS platform I talked about, and then we have guys that focus on data warehousing. Okay? And we use the data warehousing methodologies, and then we have guys that focus on database administration. So database administration, those guys are heavily focused on making sure our databases are performant, they're up, they're backed up, we could restore it at any point in time, all of those things. So maybe you can share the size of our data warehouse and databases. Yeah, for sure. So we move, I haven't checked for a while, it's, uh, we move about three terabytes of data around the world um, throughout the day. We use SQL replication and CDC to do that. And then our corporate data warehouse is pushing just over three, almost four terabytes right now. Um, each of our individual markets, I think China's about one and a half terabytes and the US is about one and a half terabytes. And then each of the markets scales on the size from there. And then we pull it all together and we build up the corporate data warehouse. So we do a lot of data movement. We work a lot with the sysadmin groups where we're moving data across the pipe and we have to have, uh, we have to have all these really interesting solutions to, to overcome some of the slow pipes and the redundancy and things like that. The, the pipe between us and China isn't always that stable. For some reason, it tends to fall apart once in a while. And uh, we have to figure out how to recover the data, how to make sure that we don't have holes and gaps and, and all of those things. Because in today's day and age, and I hear a lot of people ask me questions about big data and about you know data science and some of those kinds of things. In today's day and age, a company's real crown jewels is their data. It's, it's their intellectual property and it's their data. And uh, that's, that's really kind of what we're responsible for and what we focus on is all, is all of that stuff, okay? Um, let's see, I'm gonna jump through a couple slides here. Uh, I already talked about the growth of the company, so we're about 30 years old, 32 now, right? Pushing 32 years old. Uh, my slide's old, apparently I need to update it to 19 countries. This is a picture of our graph of our growth, and you can't see the scale here, but this is, this is a couple years old, this was $1.2 billion in sales, and our company just continues to grow and expand. Now, we're doing it on a very purposeful front. We don't grow astronomically like we could, but we do grow very purposefully, and so we're looking to make those investments. What that means from an IT perspective is we're trying to look out the next three to five years and say, where's the company gonna grow, and how are our systems going to expand to grow that appropriately? How is our database systems going to handle that kind of data? How is our software going to be able to hand that many, handle that many more orders or that many more uh, presentations or that many more enrollments? In IT, we say we have two, we have two core jobs. Our, our first job is to take orders and enrollments. We've got to make sure the cash register is still flowing. And our second job is to pay our marketing executives because it's that reciprocal synergy that pays out people and then they go, hey, this is good, I can refer somebody else. Or for somebody else, and they can, and then they can make more money from from the the product. So, interesting fact about Meluca: we have ninety six percent of our customers that ordered last month will order again this month. Okay, think about that for a minute. How many places do you go last month that you go again this month? I don't even go to the same gas station last month versus this month. Right? It's just like wherever I'm at, I'll stop. So we have a really good retention rate for customers that ordered with us last month that are coming to order again this month. And what that means from my perspective and from my teams is we have a ton of data about our customers, about their purchase history, about the products they like, and where we're going with all of that data. So at Mel Luca, we, uh, like I said, we're, we're, these are all of our products. Anybody ever use Mel Luca products? Yeah? My favorite, here's my favorite Mel Luca product. Oh, I took the label off. This is my chapstick. The vanilla bean chapstick, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like the only thing, my wife uses the rest of the products to like clean the house and feed the kids and all that. And my only request is that I get the vanilla bean, the, the vanilla bean chapstick, so. So can I interject one thing? Please. Really quick. So when, when John said, hey, he keeps the cash register going, most of that is done via e-commerce. So it's one of the things that we don't do a great job in talking about, but of that $1.75 billion, over 85% of that was done online. So during our high points per month, this may be old data, but 
during our peak volume, we can have 24 orders per second sustained. And John has to have the systems on the back end to keep up with that type of volume. Um, so if we just took our e-commerce business alone, we didn't take our catalog business, we just looked at e-commerce, we would be in the top 75 e-commerce companies in North America. And uh, a lot of times people don't think of Melaleuca as a technology company, and you know they see the fancy building, but um, yeah, I mean, we're one of the biggest e-commerce companies uh, around, and we just happen to be you know, 45 miles up the road. Great. The castle I already mentioned. The whole third floor up here is for IT. This is where we spend all of our time up here on the third floor. <coughs> My team sit right behind this window here and uh, play with play with the data. When I first came to Melaleuca, we were doing about 40% of our orders online, and after we did the conversion to the .NET website, we're now doing about 85% of our orders online, pretty consistently. Okay. So let me talk about a couple other areas of how we use technology at Melaleuca. I'm specifically focused on the data, but we do a lot of other things. Okay. We, um, we already mentioned the website. Like Jeff mentioned, we're, we're placing tons of orders all the time. This is a picture of our distribution center. So anybody that's interested in supply chain and automated distribution and things like that, that's the distribution center in Idaho Falls. We have another one that's bigger than the one in Idaho Falls over in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we have a lot of automated systems that help run and fulfill those orders. Okay? So we run all of the distribution through there. We have these automated systems that keep track of all the boxes and they come across and they weigh themselves and if they're not the right weight, it kicks it off this way and if it is, then it moves down for packaging and, and all of those things, right? So when you, get, when, you, when you grow a company to this large, you have to start, act, you have to start uh, acting at this enterprise level and that's where technology really becomes a crucial, crucial step. So we have individuals in IT that are focused solely on the distribution center. And they go out and they're running, they're running systems and queries and, and checks to make sure all the boxes are packaging and all the boxes are, are shipping appropriately and all the manifests are working with all of our shipping carriers and all of that kind of information. We actually just built a, one, of our, one of the projects our software team just finished up this uh, about the last six months is we built a new cartonization algorithm for our packaging software. And the reason we did is because we have non-standard box sizes and product sizes. And so we had to go in and we had to catalog all of our product sizes and all of our boxes. And we built a cartonization algorithm that says you ordered this, this list of items and we calculate out and figure out what's the right box for you so that we can reduce, so that we're not sending extra large boxes. Anybody ever got a box from Amazon and there's like a little teeny thing in this giant box? Amazon does cartonization too and they do a pretty good job, but we were having the same problem. We'd send out like this giant box and they'd open it up and there's like a little box of vitamins in the corner, right? So we had to kind of go through and figure that out to reduce our cost because <coughs> over in China, they had people, this was their full-time job, we had two or three people that were just looking at the boxes and if it wasn't full enough, they'd take everything out, throw the box away, and get a smaller box and repack it. And so then we brought in the technology and said, let's build an algorithm that does most of this work for us so that we can process more orders at a faster pace. And that's the type of things that we're involved in as we grow. Um, a couple other really interesting things. I wasn't personally involved in this, but um, it's kind of hard to see on this. We bought a robot for our CEO. So he's got a little robot that's got a screen on it, and he can control it from his office. And the robot goes around the shop floor in Knoxville, Tennessee, because he's a very personable person and he wants to interact with the employees out there. And it's hard for him to fly out there and fly back and fly out there and fly back. So we bought this robot. And he just goes on tours and visits with people and sees how they're doing and things like that. That was a, that's a news clip for a That's kind of a fun, like, non-standard technology thing that we we'll kind of get involved in once in a while. Here's a picture of our call center. So the second floor of the building, right, is largely part of our call center. And these are individuals that are taking phone calls, assisting customers, um, processing payments, all of those kinds of things. And the software we use for that is all homegrown. So we built our own software for that as well. We have an internal CRM that we built. We call it Compass. I'll tell you one of the worst things. IT guys, we're horrible at naming things, right? We come up with the weirdest thing. The system before this one was called Custom. That's it, just Custom. The one before that was called Legacy. But we have a system right now, the name is More. Who names a product More? It, it's so confusing. Whenever we're having conversations with people and say, hey, we need more information, they're like, are you talking about more of the system or just more?